Looks like my brother was never even here. Umbrella probably doesn't know where he is either. What did he do? Why are they after him? I don't know. But he's been missing for three months. I was in Paris looking for him. I broke into one of Umbrella's labs. But I got caught. And you were sent here. What about you? What's your story? Shut up! I don't want to talk about it! Not really much history to cover this time. We follow pretty much everybody in Raccoon City. Hunk makes off with the G-Virus sample and Ada also escapes the city's final facial with the G-Virus sample. The month of November is spent celebrating St. Martin's Day and the bounties of the autumn harvest. Come December, it's back to the crusade to end Umbrella. My base has been destroyed. And thanks to you, the experimental T-Virus was released creating countless zombies and monsters. Zombies and monsters? Fun. 2000 was the turn of the new millennium. Millennium Dance. Millennium the TV series. Millennium. The arbitrary milestone in our year counter was every excuse to wear white and party like the good times were never gonna end. This was Sega's time to shine. Uncontested in the Gen 6 console war, the Dreamcast was pumping out classics like its very existence depended on it. Spoilers. It's still getting new games. Early on in the new millennium, our lives were blessed with Resident Evil Code Veronica. Game 4, Episode 6 of our Pornhub original series. We once again follow the adventures of Claire Redfield and Leon Kennedy on their quest to stop Umbrella. No. Wait, we want the man to die for tragic drama, and we need Leon to give some sassy one-liners to Hispanic Napoleon. Get it? Because he's small, and he has a Napoleon complex. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? So we follow just Claire Redfield on her campaign to take down Umbrella. Only not really, she's just looking for a guy that she just can't seem to find. She considers him a missing person. There's no trace of the guy. So her solution naturally is to trespass in a high profile lab seeking information that they may or may not have on them. She gets caught after performing a legal mass voluntary manslaughter of men just doing their jobs. Like imagine if you're just a security guard and some self-righteous college prick breaks in and murders your coworkers. They rightfully lock her up, hopefully for the death penalty, and she's placed on some island being rim-jobbed by a failed genetic experiments, being watched over by an incestuous bipolar member of the LGBT community. She decides she needs help, so in the scene here, since it's still 1998, she goes on Yahoo Mail and says, Hey Leon, got myself into a real pickle here. People are trying to apply consequences for my reckless actions. Here's where I am. Come and get me. Leon, who at this point in the story is being detained by the government for secret agent training, We have the authority to do as we please with you. Because he's a survivor? Not Claire, because who wants a child rapist? Don't you trust me? Not Kevin, despite being a survivor in the same precinct. He's just a loser. And keeping track of your own canon is difficult. I can see that. None of the other survivors are taken either. Who needs them? It's pretty much just Leon. He is the lucky candidate who gets arbitrarily abducted from his life. The child is taken too, but meh. So Leon, from whatever top secret facility he's in at this point, is just able to casually check his mail. He gets Claire's message but is unable to do anything about it because he's not in charge of his own life at this point. 
So his response is to just email the guy Claire herself got captured to find and says, Hey Chris, pay some attention to your fuckhead of a sister because I can't keep being the dumpster she piles her problems onto. She's in jail because you wouldn't respond to her IMs. I get it. She's needy. Chris, promise me. Please promise that you won't leave me alone again. Here's where she is. Do what you will. So the missing guy, the one Claire couldn't contact in any way, shape, or form, gets the email, says, Fuck any legal proceedings. I'm busting her out of there. There's no consequences for my actions. I'm the protagonist. Sound good? Because it did to them. I assume Chris is missing at this point because at the end of 3, Jill discovers Chris is missing, I guess. And she resolves to find him. So if I got this right, Leon and Claire resolve to take down Umbrella. And Jill resolves to find Chris. Instead, Claire is looking for Chris. Chris comes looking for Claire at the word of Leon. And the rest end up doing other things the story needs them to. I don't know. I don't know, it's, it's a mess. Co-Veronica would go on to receive a few ports. One to the GameCube titled Co-Veronica X, and one kind of remastered port to the PS Triple. Guess which one I couldn't emulate. This was the series first for fully 3D rendered environments. It was supposed to make the Dreamcast look like the sexy new piece of hardware you should be dropping the big bucks on. And that it did. While more technically impressive than its predecessors on every front, the game had a few notable downgrades when it came to the gameplay. The first was the loss of the ability to freely walk up and down stairs. This made Travel in 3 play out far more smoothly, but we're back to the button press method here. What this means is that you can't occupy stairs the same time as enemies. Fantastic option for cheesing them out, but an annoyance in most other regards. The other thing Code Veronica ditched was the dedicated aim button towards destructible targets. Instead, now you always, always, uh, now you always target destructible items over enemies if they're present. I guess I'm Asian. We had a solution for the issues this creates, but hey, fuck it. It's the classic tank control style of Resident Evil. Being completely honest with you, I could review this title in a few sentences. Format-wise, it shares a lot with its past installments and does little to shake things up. So if you've seen any of these reviews slash walk-alongs, you basically get the gist of this game. Areas of interest are locked, the keys come in all shapes and sizes while also being placed very far away from their respective locks. Your ability to keep tabs on spaces you explore will ultimately be the determining factor to your success. Enemies will stand in your way to put some pressure on your exploration so you're not simply playing mist with a horror coat of paint and slower load times. That's basically it, but hey, I like my 7 hour review videos on fucking Pokemon Ruby so I'm gonna do this point by point. Cutscene to cutscene. Steve to Steve. The game starts with the prison system failing to hold certain members of society to the same standards as others. Before we show ourselves out, I want to try something a little different this time. First, we're going to pretend that I'm new. Second, we're going to pretend that I'm actually pragmatic. I'm going to play this out observing every nook and cranny so you can see the design behind this game. If we spot something that piques our interest, we'll store it here in our visible memory database of stuff we should be mentally keeping tabs on. That way, when I say the usual criticisms, you know when I say, you can solve these puzzles in any order you want. Lock and key puzzle. Stupidly designed. It'll be more justifiable. We're gonna go through this like we're new, but not entirely stupid. We're gonna assume the best of the new player. We'll say we're a veteran player. Having a glance at our inventory, we observe we have a lighter. In version X, we're also left with some playing manuals to discourage... No, the opposite of that, to encourage us to check the rules. You also have these to begin with in the base game, but X just makes it more apparent. Per usual, it contains the basic controls, but in X they also flat out state some individual solutions to pop problems. Problems. They tell you individual solutions to problems. Like the loser puzzle. It's not something you solve conventionally. You need to wait for a story segment with your knight in shining armor. This puzzle is explicitly stated here, which leads me to wonder, were so many people that confused 
that you had to include the written solution in the game when you ported it. I can't see why else you would include something like this unless you observe people getting stuck for an unreasonable amount of time. Checking around our cell is a health pickup, visible with our lighter. To avoid the insane amount of me saying, here's a pickup, here's a pickup, here's a pickup, <laughs> I'll stick to some cleverly hidden consumables and key items. Our boy here is suffering from some withdrawals and Claire notes he could use a pick-me-up. This is an object of interest we'll want to keep a tab on. Depending on the kind of person you are, you may or may not just write him off completely. You could assume this is just some observation Claire is making. The game is going to give us some future objectives nearby to make it convenient to solve his arc later, but every puzzle involving him is completely optional. We're assuming we're a smarty pants though so we'll keep him in our visible mental log. We get to some stairs and Claire's... Nervous about it for some reason. Off the top of my head, I can't recall if this effect was used in the prior games. I know some doors had zombies behind them, but that kind of stuff was used sparingly. Here though, they really wear out the welcome of the effect. Thankfully, this is X, so we can just break the frame rate and carry on. Arriving topside, it's another cutscene. We've barely had any time to get our feet wet, but we're thrust into a combat scenario with our trusty hunting knife. An object of interest is also highlighted for us because we'll need it for a bit later, so let's log that away. It's a little bizarre how a survivor of Raccoon City is still alarmed at this routine situation of slow moving target practice. I mean, you were just in the city, like, three months ago. She should be laughing this stuff off. FDA, actually. Aunt, I'm tired. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Stay here and I'll bring the limousine around as quickly as I can. Will you watch Rani for a minute? No, don't leave her with your fucking kid! Claire's primary weapon this time around is, without question, the knife. It's good. Like, stupid good. I've got you now. Before its effects on even the most routine enemies was minimal. You couldn't stun them, consistently trip them without taking a bite to the ass, or really do much of anything with it. Its damage sucks, its ability to crowd control sucks. It was a weapon of last resort, usually resigned to the item box. You basically never touched this weapon unless you sucked that bad. Claire is deliberately not given a firearm prior to this engagement. Whereas in the previous three games, you had a handgun on your person to start. If they wanted you to feel powerless and run, you wouldn't have any weapon at this point. Instead, you've been handed the knife and four targets. Four chances for the player to discover what a fucking weapon this knife is. This knife may as well be the Saints Row dildo bat, and zombies, which are the vast majority of enemies in this game, may as well be walking lubed up vaginas. This weapon just inserts itself right into the middle of the shitty lives of these enemies. For complete, indomitable success in this game, you need three things. Spacing, recognition, and two swipes. Literally all it takes. Whether there's one of them, or all of them, it doesn't, it literally doesn't matter. For your spacing. As long as you place yourself a little out of range of the enemy and allow him to approach, you can consistently make the attacks needed to place the enemy on the floor and finish the job. Ironically, the more of them they are, the easier this is to pull off since they don't usually end up in other attack patterns. Speaking of, there are attacking patterns to these zombies. Maybe this has always existed, but once you've resolved to use a firearm, these attack patterns are mostly meaningless. However, the zombies do in fact have certain tells and behaviors which will infringe upon your no damage knife only run. Sometimes the little bastard will just book it at you. His walking pace will pick up, he'll stick out his arms, he'll give you a good old rub. rub. This should be way more threatening than it is, but if the zombie enters this attack pattern, you'll more often than not just drop him down with a single swipe as opposed to two. I used to believe there was some distinction between Chris and Claire's knives. Chris seemed to drop enemies a little more easily than Claire, 
But now that I understand them a little better, it just seems that the zombies are a bit more aggro in Chris's story. They engage in the speed walk more often, so it becomes easier to drop them with one swipe as a result. I still feel like he gets luckier than Claire with the one shots, maybe the arc of his swing has something to do with it. In big groups, I definitely felt like Chris was downing enemies a bit easier, but I'm still not completely certain on what causes the one shot. You can get them down without the faster walking cycle, but they tend to reliably go down in one shot when they engage in their speed walk. Who knows, maybe it's all fucking luck. The other behavior they engage in is far more dangerous than their slightly faster shovel. See, sometimes these fucks just play dumb. You could be standing a few feet away from them and they'll just be like walking into a wall, innocent as can be. I might even have a laugh at just how stupid the AI is behaving. It seems harmless, but if you touch them while they're like this, take a swing, look at him wrong. If you fuck with him like this, then it's a free hit on you. Every time. It took me a moment to catch on because usually you're just being spammed with this or that. When you encounter scenarios like this, swiping down resolves a good 80% of the problem. But acting borderline retarded, even more so than they already do, is a legitimate tactic zombies attempt to use. The way to snuff that out is to run by them, like you would when attempting to avoid the enemy. In this case, it's literally running next to them so they can't turn fast enough to grab you. Too far and they'll latch on, and too close, you're running dead on into them. You gotta swerve right in their personal space. When you see this fucker trying to fake you out, just pass him by, right in his stupid little turn radius. Let him attempt the grab, then swipe down. If you can identify when this is happening, you can effectively avoid all damage from zombies. They're worthless. Complementing this standard enemy zombie, we've got dogs, and they're even more pathetic than the last time. You can almost just stand still as soon as you hear them and just swipe down with no tact whatsoever. You'll watch them launch themselves onto your blade, which will stunlock them until they die. They're not the brightest. We've got these lance stretch arm bucks which aren't stunned by the knife, but it still hits them pretty hard. The first one you fight has a higher health bar because it's a boss but every subsequent one will go down with relatively few slashes. I don't opt for that approach since it's harder to avoid damage and instead just use the bow gun's explosive rounds, which does stun them. Next, we have the spider enemies which don't appear until later on in the game, but by this point you should have the firepower to put them down because the knife can't reliably stun them. We've got hunters which can be knifed to death relatively quickly but can't be stunned. I usually end up just putting one shotgun shell to kick them down before using the knife. If I'm really stacked on ammo, which I usually am, I just keep shooting, cause fuck hunters. There's bats, which play the part of the agile, annoying, airborne enemy. And lastly, we have these. These flying poison generating bugs. I can't overstate how much I hate their existence. If they were another living person, I would wish actual cancer upon them. That word is thrown around online like a common insult, but I legitimately mean I don't want to see the deplorable disease that is cancer slowly take away everything that this person was. I would revel in watching them waste away into nothing. Then when that person was bedridden and too weak to do much of anything on their own, I'd visit them every single day just to do something small that irritated them. Little things just to get under the skin. They're completely aware of what you're doing but you keep a friendly face just to salt the wound. Then eventually the cancer would do its job, and I would line up again to repeat that process for every single one of these enemies. i do it for free, too. Fuck, I would pay every time to do it. These enemies can fuck off. Besides these enemies, there's a few bosses to overcome, but we'll get to those. The point of this long tangent is simply to say, the knife is great in this game. It does incredibly well against the default enemy. The default enemy is a majority of conflicts, therefore you can easily stack ammo for enemies not so beholden to the knife's bullshit. This is only of course if you realize that the knife can be used in this fashion. If not, you'll find yourself scarce on handgun ammo if it's used as a default weapon. You'll find yourself quite prepared if you use a combination of the knife and firearms, but the best course of action is to just use the knife. So where the fuck are we? The beginning. Fun. So passing this initial area, we encounter not Leon S. Kennedy. Relax, beautiful. I said I was sword. Claire's a girl, so we'll only slow him down. He leaves us, and we've now got a handgun in our inventory. 
This area's got a few exits, so being thorough and checking all of them will reveal that one of them requires a key shaped like its hole. So this is our third item to store in our VML. Pressing the only way we can find is a prison house, which is completely optional, but we don't know that. If we head inside and get the pickups, we potentially waste some of our precious resources on enemies we don't need to encounter. So unless we're good at avoiding things or really good at reliably using our knife, I would guess this area more or less just drains the first time player of some resources. In exchange, you get some Uzis. Pretty much Uzis, whatever. So spooky thing happens as we leave, then spooky thing happens as we turn the corner, then we head into a yard. There's a gate we can't pass through and a shutter we can't open, so the thorough player will keep a tab on that. Then we get to this fancy metal detector. It just forces you to unarm yourself, and after this initial segment, the concept is just completely dropped. You're never asked to explore any other area unarmed. You're only forced to run by, like, three zombies. Then you can choose to engage the rest if you so choose. Here, our thorough character finds a 3D printer and a space to put two items, so they store that in their mental log. Passing through a door, we find Steve closing X video and pretending to research Chris. No idea why, he's just supposed to be fighting an airport because he heard mention of it. Hey, I heard there's an airport around here. Well, once I find it, I can finally escape from this crazy island. But Claire sends an email to Leon and then our thorough character will find a door being blocked by an object to log away, a metal which will start our key item log, and a lock release device. We now have roughly seven things in our log, one key item, and we flip the switch which has unlocked something. With all of this laid out for us, we can easily see the only things plausible to be affected by the lock release switch is something locked. That's our gate and our shutter. So our next area of interest is the yard we pass by. We can also figure the metal goes into the 3D printer area, since we can't take it with us to unlock the door with the metal shaped lock. Heading back to the yard and opening our shutter, haha, -ha, video game, spam the player with enemies because they made some progress. Our thorough player will then obtain a fire extinguisher as well as a set of keys. They'll also observe a door with an indigo slab indentation. Just more things to keep in our log. Because this is all laid out for us, we can easily see that the briefcase is our next destination since we picked up a fire extinguisher. So the shittiest enemies in the game try to do something. The game wisely forces us to unlock the shortcut from the other side of the prison house because otherwise these useless enemies are effectively pointless. Long story short, we use our fire extinguisher and get our briefcase. The seasoned thorough player knows to observe this item and get its contents, some non-metal 3D printable material. If you killed all the zombies here before, they respawn here again. They'll keep respawning here over and over, so this area pretty much just consumes resources, be it ammo or health. It's a little strange that we have the fire extinguisher after using it, but we ignore it for now. Checking our log, it's pretty easy to see we should head back to our 3D printer. The metal and slab will yield a key we can use to leave. Once we get that key, haha, video game, so scary. We take the things we need and use our new key on the door we observed earlier, ending the initial prison segment. So normally I would have just run through this briskly and said that the level design was pretty smooth in essence, but this way you can see exactly why. From the moment we stepped out of the basement, a diligent player has pretty much telegraphs everything they need to beat this opening segment without too much aimless exploration. You're effectively told where to go by the things you observe and the things you pick up. To this opening area's credit, you pass by all the things you need before you go through the sequence of putting the keys in the locks. But the caveat here is that this is only true if you actually gave a fuck to look around. Because this skill here, this mental log that I'm visualizing for you, this is a dying skill. It's also the one these games test the most. See, nowadays, most big releases follow the design by waypoint. If it's important, it's on the map. You have a compass and a marker or an arrow over your head or a line on the floor or fucking bat vision. Nowadays, we have all sorts of things to keep you moving forward. Because heaven forbid, something stops you forcing you to actually use your brain for two seconds. We can't trust design to tell you these things anymore. Someone vomits their Oscar winning story at you, you walk at the marker, something happens, then the cycle continues. This franchise is no different. I've watched too many people who have recommended older titles just 
get mad that the solution wasn't obvious. They just hated that they weren't shooting at something or things weren't happening around them because it's boring otherwise or they weren't dancing like an asshole. I know too many people who pick up something like this and just quit because they just wanted shit handed to them. They want to cruise through an experience. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are that. But the skill of just keeping a world's significance straight in your head is practically dead. It's not tested in the majority of our mainstream games. See, my first time through, I definitely wasn't this thorough. I went through doors as soon as I was able to. I definitely spent more time in the prison than I care to admit because I tend to shut my brain off and doing these things until I get stuck. I admit it, I'm also used to 8th generation bullshit. But performing this exercise is pretty much how I determine when to say or not to say the game has any unfair roadblocks. You getting stuck here is definitely not the game's fault. It's telling you everything as long as you're actually willing to look. This is my metric for complaining about shit, he said three fucking reviews later, because that's when you should be detailing your scale for shit. Some top-notch reviewing skills there, but it's usually pretty clear-cut if something was my fault or something was actually the game's fault. Remember, I can basically describe this whole game as the keys are far away from their locks and memory is your best friend. But here's a good example. We've now left the prison, but in our mental log for the area, we haven't quite ticked off every box. We have a sickly man we still haven't helped, we have a door with a unique key, and a door being blocked by an object. There's still things to do, we just can't do them now. We're gonna have more stuff thrown at us, we're gonna have more enemies spammed down our throat, and all of this is going to consume a good amount of time. Despite that, it's on us to remember we have some unfinished business here, otherwise we're gonna get bent over and shamelessly butt-bucked pretty hard. It's pretty easy to see how either a player adverse to combat or a player bad at exploration will miss the slab door. If you're avoiding zombies, you're not gonna run in that area. You can leave the prison without ever stepping foot in that alley. However, once you get a second blue emblem, you're not gonna fucking know where that shit goes, and you need this door for other key items. You're gonna drive yourself insane just trying to guess where the slab goes. Then you'll have to comb every room, one by one, looking for the one thing you miss. This is where the difficulty of the game comes from. It's not enemies, though some of them are stupid and some of the weapon telegraphing which simplifies these encounters are stupid. It's not your technical skill, it's your ability to keep stuff in your head. That's what's going to determine how much of a hard time you have with Code Veronica or any classic Resident Evil. If you combine this type of design where you're shown a lock way before its key with the fact that someone may save and come back later, it becomes even easier to see why someone may get stuck but how many, if any, of these situations are unfair? Let's find out. Claire finds herself at a bridge, but this canyon is just a connection to three areas of interest. The training ground, the palace slash residence, and the airport. For now, we can go to two, and depending on the order, you'll either find keys to locks you haven't found yet, or locks you can't open yet. This game is going to pad out its time by spreading all that shit out between three different areas. Your ass is backtracking. But let's see how well the game leads our veteran player along. The closest area to access is the training ground, but it's also out of view, so I imagine a few first-timers just completely skipped this and went straight to the palace. We're going here, however. We'll find some shit dogs, which will be replaced by a worm. The worm will be the first thing we find if we grab the car key from the airport before coming here, however. Just some stupid knowledge I have for wasting my life on this game for too long. The Eau Claire will dispatch the dogs, add an elevator we can't use to the VML, and head into the nearest building. Up directly to our right, a door with no knob is observed, so that shit gets logged. Then we find ourselves a bow gun and a door with a passcode key that we can't quite use yet as well, so the shit just keeps stacking and stacking. We get booted out of the room and it's locked behind us, electronically. We take our next open room option for a map and two more locked objects for our VML. So six things for this area already. Next to the room we were just in, it's another electronically locked door. So seven. We proceed ahead and find ourselves in the Hot Springs episode of the anime and actuate a valve. Its effect is immediate, so we don't need to log this. Here we find a key and a device to control water current, which is broken. This serves no purpose, it's a red herring for the running waterfall, but the new player doesn't know that, so it should be locked. The key will open the storage locker, and we're now unable to explore anything else from this area, so we're forced to move on. 
That leaves us with seven unsolved mysteries. The keys to these locks will be found elsewhere, so as long as we hit the spot first, we'll have an idea of what to do when we find them. So we plop over to the palace area and we find a navy proof just lying on the floor. Inside scouting around on the lower floor is a bathroom with extra pickups, a locked door in the back, and a computer which controls the locked door. Upstairs, a door marked with a silver crest, and access to our first save room. With what we observe here, it should be obvious where to go next. I've gone through two areas and a tiny bit of a third, so hopefully by now you understand what's going on with the item list on the right. I'm marking what keys under what locks, in the order it happens in. Assuming the player checks everything they're able to. I'm gonna let the list do the bitch work of the puzzles while I focus on other shit, that way you can still check me on any claims I make about puzzles. Maybe that'll work, maybe it'll be a train wreck, maybe I really don't want to have to verbally explain all of this as we've barely just begun. Not only does this area throw some more locked passages in our face, it also gives us an item with no discernible purpose. Unless you ignored the big ass mansion and ran straight ahead of you, you're gonna have no clue what the steering wheel goes to. The explorable space isn't too big though, and you should conclude to move on once you've scavenged the few rooms available. The loser door was highlighted for you while solving the computer bits, so you may end up trying to snag them through some other means. Failing to grab the steering wheel for any reason won't trigger the rescue event, so the player just has to be content with moving on without them for the time being. Again, this is literally mentioned in the playing manual, so I guess this whole setup was enough of a jackass to warrant the devs just telling you what to do. At this point in time, the design seems to be steering you to all the major areas so you have them on radar. There's really nothing in the training ground, but you pretty much just need this one pickup before carrying on with your day elsewhere. Once you hit the airport, the puzzle structure will become a bit more sprawling. Unlike the previous games, which confined its most complex puzzle segment in one area, the entire island will basically serve as this game's mansion segment. Precinct segment, or city segment, take your pick. These introductory spaces look like they're just trying to one-up the spot that came before it in scale. Looks cool, huh? Yes. Oh, I need those. Give them to me. Good old. It took me longer than I care to admit, but why is Claire's face so much worse when you're in control of her? I know the GameCube shouldn't have problems rendering her with this level of detail, and I'm pretty sure it's not out of the Dreamcast scope. It's weird we have the clear CGI models for high-end cutscenes, then there's special models for in-game cutscenes, then there's a model for playing the game, then there's Steve's model with his normal hair, then X changes it, they give him a dumbass smile in his section, I don't fucking know. With the steering wheel in hand, we can enter the last main area. All we need from here is the biohazard card but we will encounter even more shit to keep tabs on. The random proof we found earlier is given its ultimate purpose, and our goal becomes clear. We need three medals. No. We need three precinct keys. No. We need three train components. No. We need some death masks. No. We need two more proofs to gain access to this plane. Gotcha. Come along, Claire. You know how this goes down. Checking our mental log, we can see the biohazard card has use in the training ground, so we backtrack there. Unlocking this door and heading forward brings us together again with Sir Crossdress. You're streamlined into getting the gold losers after a first encounter with the stretch arm fucks. Once you've got those, you've arbitrarily taken control of Steve for a brief section of gameplay. Since the guns you give him are lost to your arsenal, you really have no reason not to mow everything down in your path. Unless you just want to be more of a dick to Claire, I guess. Depending on the number of kills, your little reunion in the end will change. Check it out! I pulled through without a scratch! I even saved ammo for future use! See? You can depend on me. Controls returned to Claire, but not before hearing a sob story about Steve's dad. Before leaving, we can poke around the floors a little more for both some more locked passages and a key which will give us some rooting options. Grabbing this indigo plate and checking our log, we easily see two potential uses. Not to mention, we've also got the key to the save room door in our hands. 
With all the hullabaloo over the losers and how out of the way the plate is, I wager newbies go for the door to the residence. But we can either finish off the training ground by obtaining the blue card, get a key item for the residence by returning to the prison, or just go directly to the residence for an item to open up some palace doors. This is where I'd imagine a difficulty spike happens for the player, as you're now responsible for keeping tabs on these rooting options. And you weren't led by the nose to the indigo plate, only to the losers. If you run straight to the residence, you only find an item for the palace. The game won't lead you back to the training ground for the plate. Doing our thorough thing will root ourselves for the blue cards so we can finish exploring the final rooms of the training ground before leaving. The second floor shenanigans will allow us to end the venting from the other room and get a pirate painting as well as the second key to our three lock airport panel. Setting the painting reveals a miniature model of the world with a gold key. The diorama has a blank slot for an item so we'll have to keep a tab on that. This and a few other of our observed items are solved by Chris, so these things can effectively create more smoke and mirrors when exploring. A new player eager for the 100% playthrough won't know Chris's role in the story, so they could be led on a wild goose chase for items they simply cannot obtain yet. When an item is used for the last time, it's discarded, but we're still hanging on to the fire extinguisher and an indigo card. You could potentially waste time scavenging around for doors and objects meant for Chris. The basement indigo slot didn't lead to anything significant, so checking our inventory of options, most of our items are suited to the palace, so it's time to backtrack there. Assuming you're supposed to get the silver and gold keys in that order, I guess the devs expected you to run straight to the palace. I should reread that again, but I'm not gonna. With our rooting, we can get an item we need to push ourselves a little further on the residence prior to visiting, but it's impossible to prep ourselves to one-shot the area on a first visit. Maybe it's the forced backtracking, maybe it's because we just had to have this bukkake on the connecting bridge, but I feel like they could reward players who keep tabs on the world a little more by allowing them to prep for future areas more effectively. Because the residence items are essentially locked by blue plates, and we still need a silver key from the residence to access one of them, we're incapable of just hitting the area once. The last proof is in the attic of the residence. Maybe they just thought that one-shotting this location would end the first segment too quickly or something. Unlike the previous titles, there's only two main areas of the game, the island and the Antarctic. In the past... Yeah, in the past, that's correct. In the past, one main area with backtracking led to one-off segments in the end. Even RE2's more complex lab and RE3's power playing segments weren't that complex when compared to its initial segment. The bulk was in the beginning areas. Here the whole game is structured with that initial layout in mind to make the most out of the limited space. Rockford is diverse, but each of the five areas are fairly minuscule. Spreading out puzzles is nothing new. Walking from one end of the island to another to slot in a key is no different than picking up mulch on one end of the mansion to use on the other side, or a circuit breaker to use on the other end of the precinct, or needing to use a battery in an elevator you find a ways back. The philosophy of the puzzles hasn't changed, it's the game's basic structure. Two main areas, both complex requiring backtracking with some options to change your routing. Maybe the 3D nature of the game just made it too difficult to follow the same structure of the older games. I know it can be done, but this is the first 3D Resident Evil, so... Meh. It's not really a loss. The initial segments of Resident Evil are where the meat of the gameplay is. Back to the palace, it's suddenly filled with more enemies. Using our gold key, we get the most difficult puzzle in the game, because it requires you to read. It requires use of two notes and a correct sequence of seven switches. The basis for this is just getting the order of the Ashford line correctly. It of course starts with Veronica, and the next few are given away. But a few key factors are missing to piece the whole thing together from the note alone. Checking around the room, you get one more bit of context for some more certainty in the order. I always do it from memory now, but initially it was the kind of brain teaser I rarely see nowadays. The item received from here needs to be checked for the real thing we want. Now out of options, we can only use the losers to press to our last area of the island. We get a puzzle with convoluted instructions to make us type out 1971. Naturally, haha, video game, you solve the thing. 
We don't really care, we just proceed for the residents. Here the stretch arm fucks and bats take over the enemy duty and here's where rooting can have some effect on your experience. I didn't know this until recently but the lighter repels bats for some reason. You could have traded out your lighter for a lockpick at this point and it would have made them much more of a pain in the ass to deal with. Having the lockpick makes the stretch arm fucks easier to deal with since you'll have more access to explosive rounds and an auto gun but aerial enemies are still fantastically fucking annoying to deal with at this point in the series. I head here first because I find it easier to repel two enemies as opposed to take on a bunch of bats. Anywho, we find a bipolar man and break into his room playing the creepy song. It basically tells us we need a king and queen and key, and we find a silver one just lying on the bed. To spare an overtly long process of backtrack describing, the key will unlock the other two palace doors. The casino room has the king ant object, which we can't access until some sheet music is played on the piano. The other yields the second indigo plate. Like I mentioned earlier, this section of the game could have you stumped since you encountered the slot for this plate back in the beginning of the game, and you've had more than enough time to let it slide from your memory. Once we're back, we can swap our lighter for a lockpick and push a box out of the way to gain access to items we were forced to leave in the security box, or never bothered to grab in the first place. The most important of these consumable items is the BOW gas rounds. With a basic description, it's easy to write these off as merely another ammo type for the grenade launcher. Fuck, I've actually used all three rounds on the same enemy in my first few playthroughs. Nowhere is the mention that this shit literally has the health of what you're fighting. I'd cite two bosses as a potential difficulty spike. Mace Hands, McAsshole, and the final boss, which spams the shit out of you with plant enemies and leeches. Without this knowledge, these two bosses consume a stupid amount of ammo, and at this point, when you're at Mace Hands, your ammo reserves are roughly as follows. I'm sure despite my attempts at thorough play, I've somehow missed some pickups. But not consuming any ammo at all, we've got 465 handgun rounds, 30 explosive crossbow rounds, plus 300 normal rounds, 12 grenade rounds, 6 acid rounds, 6 flame rounds, 3 of the best rounds of the game, and 100% of an M100P. An M100P. That's what you're given up until this boss. Several areas will never stop respawning enemies, so depending on how you moved around and whether or not you used the knife, your reserves to kill this thing is up in the air. Prior to finding the knife was a fucking godlike wand of sodomy, I used the handgun rounds on zombies, averaging roughly 2 kills per clip of 15. With 465 rounds, that's 62 zombie kills. It's pretty easy to hit that number of encounters in your time here. The crossbow roughly worked out the same, killing 2 zombies per 15 shots. Each explosive round would be a guaranteed kill, but I used them to 2 shot the stretch arm fights. Not counting the boss, you pass by two at the bridge, two in the plate room, two in the residence, and one because you solved the puzzle. 14 rounds I definitely use because it's the best way to stun lock them for a kill. Seeing it all piled up like this, the game seems generous, but it has its ways to drain your reserves. And with counts like this, it's not difficult to see how a newbie could end up on a knife by mace hands. Using the gas rounds, you can get by on grenade rounds alone. It's stupid how much of a game changer this stuff is, and I have no doubt Conservus probably opted for other weapons since you only have 3 rounds. All I'm trying to say is this shit is important. It makes life easy. I'm ashamed at how long it took me to realize what a fucking weapon the BOW gas is. Anywho, long story short, some fuck shit leads us to a handgun mod which makes it competitively viable, and our piano roll. So far, this is the only not-nemesis or outbreak zombie that will actually follow you through a door. If he's smart enough to open a door, I don't know why everybody else is struggling so hard. We can warp back to the palace, but not before meeting a familiar face. You must be the lovely Claire Redfield. Yes. <laughs> Normally, we just carry on with our puzzles nearing the end. But X throws in some more face time with Wesker. He just beats the shit out of Claire. The kind of male on female violence you will never see on a television show. She gets the fucking dookie smacked out of her. 
and she deserves it, as she is a mass murderer escaping her sentence. Wesker's like, you've got more value alive, nee. and then he goes away. Okay. Claire just gets up and keeps going. No alterations to her health. Whatever. The piano roll yields the King Ant object, and we can now access the attic of the resident. Because we're near the end of Claire's time on Rockford, we've of course got to be spammed with enemies. The bridge and the mansion encouraging you to waste valuable ammo, which you may need later for mace hands. Self-contained puzzles in the area lead us to the last proof. Our encounters with this talented voice actor culminate in learning the depths of his actual insanity. But whatever. With all proofs in hand, it's time to leave with Steve. Yahoo! Despite the number of times playing, I never tried grabbing the Air Force proof before the others. It is a far more convenient spot to begin the countdown. The last series of puzzles are a straightforward loop around the island a second time. What I want to know is how at 17 years of age, when did this fuck learn to fly a seaplane? I had to fish around a good bit, but from the looks I'm saying it's a Martin JRM Mars. The nose looks more like a C-130, but waterborne 130s don't have the floats at that position. Not to mention that some 130s are flown with not only multiple pilots, but engineers monitoring vital components for flight. But yeah, this 17 year old Canadian gentleman can just fly this plane. I don't know how accurate this wiki page is, but it says his dad was an airfield mechanic. And because of that, he was just permitted to learn how to fly a plane. Which is fucking laughable. This creepy romance scene isn't even the thing that got my attention here. It's how the fuck this kid is a competent pilot at 17 because his dad was a mechanic. Worlds of no fucking sense. So Steve has some creepy thoughts before crashing to our next and final area, the Antarctic. It's fairly complex, but that will be for Chris to learn. Claire only has a few more things to do. Claire's workspace here is fairly limited to the bottom floor. Despite this, I took longer in this area than I care to admit. But for normal people, people who don't share my crippling autism, this final sequence of puzzles shouldn't consume too much time. The biggest confusers might be the label you need to shove on the box, but the smaller workspace leaves little room for straying off. Claire and Steve are at the ends of their campaign. The man of incest has tracked them down, but he's killed in their encounters. The real barrier to their escape is this thing, which looks like the kind of shit you don't want any part of, but you know you're gonna have to deal with it later. One of the hardest kills I've had to manage with the knife. Tangenting here, this rat that jumps out of the locker, like, has a journal, and he's been stalking Claire throughout her time on Rockford Island. Japan, why are you the way that you are? Never change. It's pretty much over for part A though. By this point, Claire seems more fun to Steve, and by their next encounter, she'll be devastated by his death. Never mind, she's 19, and he's 17, and anything you do to the child would be illegal. Like you care. Let's go over their relationship. So far, Steve has shot at you, then nope. left you behind because you were seen as a liability. Nope. Told you you essentially can't count on anybody. Nope. You had to save his life from behaving stupidly. Nope. Basically told you to fuck off and you asked for the item you needed to advance your escape directly after saving his life. Nope. Saves your life in cutscene induced weakness. <sighs> Clears your immediate next path of enemies, but ruins it by acting like an emo child. Nope. Saves your life again from cutscene induced weakness. <sighs> Mourns his zombified dead father in front of you. I guess she could relate. Give him a sympathy point. Intervenes with your encounter with a psychopath, flies you out of the area with impossible pilot skills, and attempts to kiss you while you sleep. Yeah, this kid saved your ass a few times, but he basically rode on my coattails the whole damn scenario. You ran into him frequently in the beginning, but once Pops is out of the picture, it's basically on Claire to carry the rest of the mission. He's the annoying little brother with an inexplicable useful skill at best. There's only one kind of woman I know, and if she had to carry my ass for the duration of an expedition, I'm probably not on the table for a romantic prospect. But I guess Claire is that college student that dates a high school junior. 
Don't you trust me? I trust that you're a baby rapist. Don't let him rape you. Never mind the fact she breaks into top dollar secured facilities and kills a bunch of people. She never stands trial for that shit. If this was Leon and you two grew closer after this experience, sure, maybe. That's two games together, but this substitute just makes this absolutely hilarious to watch. He's useful enough, I guess, but I don't see how you'd fall for him. Nope. Enough about Claire, though. She's about to partake in a new hentai series. This is Chris's show now. I don't know what it is with this man, but this won't be the last time where a teammate goes looking for him, only for that teammate to get captured, forcing himself to come back for the teammate. Chris's life doesn't make any sense. He gets Leon's message to come get Claire and comes prepared for Rockford Island. Then he drops everything he has and is forced to work with a minimal arsenal instead. Depending on your actions with the sick prison guard, you'll either get a chance to recover Claire's lighter to pick up anything you may have missed due to swapping it out with the lockpick, or all the lockpick items are essentially lost to your campaign. I'm not going to go through the puzzle process with Chris as it's frankly similar to Claire's. The main difference is that you come across the island in ruins, so movement from each point is more convoluted. Before carrying on, however, we find that our item box is filled to the brim with everything Claire left behind, creating some new design issues with the game. There's a reason I try my hardest to fight Norseferatu with only a knife and sniper rifle every time I replay this shit. The sniper is lost after the fight to both characters, and Chris has his own knife. This approach maximizes your puzzle solving capacity prior to finding Claire. On the flip side, if you decide to take every big gun you had for the boss, Chris is essentially stuck with his handgun. On the worst side, it's possible for Claire to be holding on to key items useful to Chris, such as the fire extinguisher and the blue indigo card. I may be a certain kind of stupid, and maybe even alone on this practice, but if I don't discard a key item after I use it, I keep it on my person when exploring new areas. I kept the card and extinguisher on Claire, expecting them to finish their roles in this facility. Then I was booted to Chris and was unable to open a useful shortcut, as well as unable to get a weapon early on when I came across the opportunity. The compensation for this is that Chris can make it by with only the shotgun he's given. Truthfully, it seems the game is balanced to assume the worst of the player. Later on, unless you simply forgot to take the fire extinguisher out of the security box, you're pretty much handed the magnum. I don't have a count of handgun ammo dispensed to Chris, but by my rough estimates, I count 105 shotgun rounds, which the shotgun can still be used for close, confirmed headshots, or a single shot to knock an enemy over for a knife finish. It's the most bang for your buck weapon. Then there's 18 magnum rounds, which because the shotgun is so effective against every enemy Chris encounters, you should just save the slugs for mulling down the final boss. That's the absolute worst case scenario. Once you learn when the game is going to pass over control, Chris will have Claire's remaining arsenal to boot. The passing mechanic happens twice. Once for reaching the end of Claire's campaign, and the second after Chris and Claire split up. On a first time playthrough, the second split is more so annoying because you're running blind. Naturally, you're gonna want weapons, but if you fail to return them to the item box at the point the switch back to Chris happens, those weapons become lost. Insult to injury, Steve is built up like a boss, so if it's your first time you might wind up taking big guns for the occasion only to find it was pointless. The character swapping between the two is just poorly done, to be considered fair for first time players. Success with this only comes once you know when the switches are happening. I digress though, we're still here on this island. The game squeezes its last bit of use out of Rockford by disorienting players with new camera angles and a different layout. There's a spike in more difficult enemy variants, and Chris will be harassed by Wesker instead of a crossdresser. At this point in the game, we'd usually be winding down with a finale event or one-off stage segments, but Code Veronica sticks to the core design through and through. And by core design, I mean point-and-click game puzzle structure. The island segments accessible are far less than Claire's, mainly concentrated in the training ground, but it's still sizable enough to consume a good amount of your time. Chris knows Claire has escaped, so he just pokes around for any kind of clue as to her new whereabouts. After utilizing some of the same items as Claire, he'll gain access to the Antarctic. This is really where Chris gets his own unique gameplay segment. 
And true to the classic RE fashion, his ultimate goal involves getting a key set to unlock a door in some mansion in the form of jewels to access the final boss. Depending on Claire's performance with Norseferatu, Chris will either find that Claire is okay or find her in a poisoned state, in which case he'll need to track some medicine in the basement. Even if he were being thorough, the thoughts Claire has on the medicine location is, there are lots of chemicals here. I wonder what they are used for. No mention of medicine of any sort. You're not in a timer when it's time to cure Claire, but it makes tracking the medicine first time a more annoying prospect than normal. To save time, it's best to carry all the blue herbs you can manage and make sure Claire is fine upon killing Norseferatu. Chris finds the dead brother, then encounters the power-hungry anime superwoman Wesker is trying to best. CVX allows him to be a little more badass than his original encounter when he was just slapped around like a fuckboy. Unlike Chris's Rockford section, the Arctic allows for a little more personal rooting. You can collect the three required jewels in several orders. The encounter with Alexia isn't fixed to the last jewel. Wesker, you're in the one universe where guns actually do their job of killing the enemy. Maybe you should try shooting her instead of fighting. Look at Chris. He ain't even on steroids yet. And he killed her. We're pretty much at the end, but let's see if I can find some other bullshit of note. Weirdly, the only boss Chris is required to kill is Alexia. The electric fish, the worm, and the giant spider can all be skipped since they're only walls to guard an object. Speaking of walls, the biggest puzzle wall will easily be the paperweight puzzle, when you need to use it to decode the correct sequence of four signals. It's one of those in hindsight it's obvious, but I know from checking online that I'm not the only one who struggled. The first Alexia fight is a one-shot kill on your end, and the only continue point you get, so if you haven't saved in a while, you lucked out. Looking back one stage, there's a model Luger Chris can get to unlock Steve in the battle game. Tangent point, I actually have no idea why Chris is still wearing his STARS uniform. The unit's been disbanded, his captain is a traitor, the city has been nuked, so are you doing this out of a weird reverence? You think he'd be wearing, like, anything else? On the final stretch, Claire gives Chris the final key item he needs to wrap things up. He needs to type a code in this computer. Some word which will begin the self-destruct sequence. Initiating the sequence, Chris and Claire make their getaway before the anime Superwoman goes over to stop them. Instead of cooperating, Chris takes the fight himself. Without BOW gas, this fight is insanely annoying. It's not difficult, because you can just spam healing, it's just tedious. There's no good consistent way to avoid damage. You'll just be hit constantly with Vine Whip and Leech Life, constantly be statused with poison, and constantly stunned out of shooting. The only thing this boss tests is your ability to bring the correct items. Did you bring enough health and big guns so you could camp a spot and shoot long enough to win the Star War? These mechanics are not suited to this type of finale event. Once you win the Star War, the next boss form is a test of luck. You get a first person weapon that shoots slow projectiles. You're faced with an airborne enemy that's agile in the sky. All you need to do is land one shot in your remaining allotted time. She's basically playing the keep away game trying to time you out to your death. To myself, despite my numerous playthroughs, her fight pattern still seems random. So I checked a commentated speedrun to see if there was something to deduce here. She seems to zigzag consistently into their shots, but I feel like I'm grasping at straws. But, can't argue with the pros. There's a method to this, I guess. The escape of Chris and Claire marks the end of Code Veronica. But in X, Wesker has one more bonus appearance to make. Chris barely escapes and declares, next time, they'll finish this. And that ends Code Veronica. The game sticks with its puzzle labyrinth design all the way. Only spanning two major areas, the world size feels smaller as a result. But to be fair, the areas are diverse in art direction. This is the most reused of area to come thus far, but the game ensures to either change level layout or introduce new content as necessary. It's upped itself in presentation, retained its campier voice elements, and took some steps back in the gameplay department. The next main installment would be a trip to the past, but the installment after that, now Stranger. That's an installment. Sanchez, go! <laughs> Don't you 
think 